and um, wanted to welcome everyone to the webinar um, with Representative Macri and Representative Chop. Um, we're here to talk about the Walk Cares program. We're also joined by uh, Ben Vecti, who is the um, program director for the Walk Cares program at DSHS. Um, so again, my name is Kathy McCall. I'm the advocacy director for AARP here in Washington State. AARP um, has been involved in the development of this legislation since its inception. Um, we started, I think, working on it in, back in 2014 um, in really looking at um, trying to address the issue of the age wave. Uh, Washington State is you know, known for our long-term care system. Um, we are recognized by the SCAN Foundation and the Commonwealth Fund um, and AARP um, for our home and community-based services and the work that we've done in terms of um, building out our home and community-based services and support. Um, so it was by natural extension that you know, we were interested in investing um, our time and resources in working with a broad coalition and multiple legislators in developing the Long-Term Care Trust Act, which created the Walk Cares Fund. Um, it, the reason that we were so determined to focus on this bill is that we had lots of data and information around um, eight people as they age that many people do not realize that they're going to need long-term care. Um, and about 70% of us um, after age 65 will need some form of long-term care. Yet we have not financially planned nor saved for it adequately to cover the cost. Um, and then the only option is if you cannot afford long-term care is to spend down what limited assets you have left in, and go on to Medicaid. We know for a fact that, you know, upwards 80% of people want to stay in their homes as they age. They do not want to go into an institutional care setting. They want to stay at home. And we wanted to figure out a solution and a way to enable more people to do just that. So that's how the Walk Cares um, Fund was created. So I first, um, before we start, again, welcome to Representative Macri and Representative Chop. Um, Representative Chop is also emeritus speaker. Um, he was actively engaged in the, um, you know, the final vote um, for the passage of this um, of the of the Long Term Care Trust Act, which created the Walk Cares program. And I'd like to open it up to you, um, Representative Chop. You have been engaged and involved in this issue, you know, just also since its inception, and probably well before that as well. Um, could you just open us up with some welcome remarks? Oh, well, yeah, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. I appreciate it. It's a, a real opportunity to share ideas and also get the questions asked and answered. So I appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, as you mentioned, I've been involved in the long term care field for quite a while. Uh, I used to work for a private uh, nonprofit agency that provided home care for uh, folks with disabilities, primarily older folks. And I'm so pleased that over the past 20 some years, we now built that home care program to be the literally the best in the nation, in large part because of active engagement of AARP and a lot of advocates. Uh, and there's over 45,000 workers now providing that services to people throughout the state. It's uh, amazingly good. And of course, we always want to look at how else we can be of, of support and helping the folks who need the help the most. Um, and so uh, we've uh, the idea of uh, is that enough for the introduction or do you want me to go into the policy <laughs> i would love you to go into the policy too that would be great okay yeah i just do want to i didn't know how long the welcome is supposed to be but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we uh, uh, from my point of view the washington cares fund is part of a long tradition in this uh, united states as well as in the state of washington uh, it's a social insurance program. Uh, it's based on the philosophy and the uh, values of the social security system, uh, Medicare, uh, the also more recently the paid family medical leave program that we're, uh, I think we have the best in the nation. And that was just enacted about four years ago. Uh, but it is a social insurance program that people contribute to and then they benefit from it. Even this last week, I've had friends of mine who were desperate that they had to go into the hospital to get uh, surgery and needed the paid family medical leave. And it was there for them. And they were like so relieved that something was there to support them when they needed it the most. And I think that's the thing we motivated us 
for the many years that we've been working on the Washington Cares Fund, but also in this whole philosophy of helping people who need help uh, at various times of their lives. So with that, I uh, leave it to that, then we can uh, respond later to questions. Thank you very Great. much. And Representative Macri, you've spent you know a good portion of your career in human services and um, you know working with people when they are in crisis, oftentimes. Um, and what what is your opinion? What is your view on the Walk Cares program as you think of how we look upstream and helping people? Yeah, thank you for that, Kathy, and thanks for having me here today and for. Um, and for putting on this convening so we can talk more about this program that I think many people are just now learning about, um, but that we passed um, in the legislature in 2019. Um, and as you say, I have worked uh, with and on behalf of um, people living with disabilities who have experienced extreme poverty, um, who've experienced homelessness, um, and many of the people that I've worked with throughout my career have needed long-term care services, um, often much earlier in life than many of us um, do. And, um, and I know just how challenging it can be to get those services, um, particularly for people who don't qualify for Medicaid. And one of the reasons that I have really supported uh, the Washington Cares um, concept since the very beginning when it was introduced in the legislature um, has to do with my own personal experiences. Um, first, um, several years ago when my brother and I were uh, charged with caring for my grandmother in her um, final years of her life, um, that's when we were um, very abruptly educated about the limits of the Medicare program. Um, it's an amazing program. And as uh, Representative Chop said, um, these social insurance programs, many of us have come to depend on um, in the US. But Medicare by design does not, um, does not pay for long term care services. And um, my grandmother, in fact, was one of those many examples that I have uh, heard about since then, who um, we had to private pay for home care for her until we ran out of money. Um, and then uh, when she was completely destitute, uh, had to apply for Medicaid to make sure that she got the care that she needed. And in fact, she was on Medicaid for only six weeks before she died. And if she were to have um, additional uh, long-term care support, I believe and know in my heart that she would have been able to stay in her own apartment for longer than um, she was able to do. Um, and, and currently, you know, as is true with many of us with elder care issues, um, my partner and I are now caring um, for my partner's dad um, who needs pretty significant long-term care services in a, in a similar circumstance. In his circumstance, he actually did purchase private long-term care insurance um, which um, puts him in a very, very fortunate spot compared to many, the vast majority of folks. 90% of us don't have long-term care, private insurance. Um, he is fortunate to have it, but he had to pay premiums until he first drew down benefits. And he first drew down benefits for home care when he was 81 years old. So he retired, was on a fixed income, depending almost exclusively on his um, social security income and his premiums went up several times during his retirement years. Um, and he persisted in paying those premiums, but most of us are not in a position to be able to do that. Um, and um, the rates did escalate many times. Um, and so I, ha I feel like I have um, a good view from multiple vantage points, um, just very personally and intimately about um, how the long-term care uh, system works, the benefits of it, particularly here in Washington. We are uh, very blessed to have my father-in-law here in Washington state, um, but that there are shortcomings and most of us are not prepared for the expense um, until it hits us. And unfortunately in the United States, we have a system where you either need to be incredibly wealthy and be able to privately pay or you, um, need to be driven into poverty to uh, be able to qualify 
for uh, state benefits through Medicaid. And that is just a broken system. And Washington Care puts Washington at the forefront for making sure the vast majority of us um, don't have to make that choice of being driven into poverty to get our long-term care needs met. Thank you so much, Representative Macri. That was a very powerful story. And thank you for sharing your personal experience because I think, you know, that's what it comes down to is each individual um, has choices and decisions to make around their long-term care. Um, so next is uh, Ben Bechti and Ben's gonna walk us through the Walk Cares program and um, a lot of the details. We are very, very fortunate to have um, Ben here in the state um, directing and managing this program. He comes with a wealth of background uh, around long-term care and has, I read his papers. <laughs> um, I, I laugh because I'm like such a geeky person <laughs> that there are policy papers on long-term care, but he's evaluated systems, you know, in Germany, uh, South Korea, Japan, um, the Netherlands, um, incredible examples of a very similar type of program. And, um, you know, he brings that wealth of knowledge to this program as well. So Ben, um, go ahead, take it away. Thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you, um, um, Representative Chop and Representative Macri for um, your stories. Uh, they all resonate with the experience that we have both, that I have both personally with my family and with the experience talking to Washingtonians over the last uh, couple of years as this program has been uh, rolled out. You know, Kathy, you mentioned those other countries, you know, one of the things we all have in common across the Washington state, across the country, across the world is that we're all parts of families, right? We're all in families and all we're all facing similar st stresses right now too, because, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, many families had a stay at home caregiver, not all families, but many had that. That doesn't exist hardly at all anymore. It's extremely rare now that a family can afford to have an adult at home, not working to, pro to provide care to family members. So most of us, who do provide care, balancing that with a job, right? And we all know how stressful it is often raising kids and taking care of an older adult all at the same time. And so uh, that's the reason why countries across the world are doing programs just like what we are doing here in Washington state. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen um, and give you a quick overview of the program. And then we can uh, go to everyone's questions uh, and hopefully uh, give people answers to their questions. Kathy, is my screen uh, showing? Yes, it is. Terrific. Let me do my little commercial for the Q&A box. So if you do have a question, um, please enter it down in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And um, as the questions come in, I'll pop in and um, we will also open them up to um, the representatives to also comment. Um, so thank you. Great, Go ahead, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, no problem. So the, we'll talk briefly, I'll talk briefly about why the state needs a new approach to long-term care. It's already been touched on, but I can expand on that with some data points. What is the Walk Cares Fund? Uh, how, why is it good for Washington? Why is it good for families? How does it work and how is it administered and overseen? And then we'll get to your questions. We all have concerns about aging, whether it's about our own future or a family member or friend. The following two scenarios are familiar to many of us. Barb's mother is in her 80s and keeps falling at home. Now she's broken her arm. She lives alone and there is no family in town to help. Siobhan doesn't wanna be a burden to her adult children. They have their own kids to care for. She's having trouble getting out of the tub and afraid of falling. These are common concerns that many of us face with aging parents and as we ourselves age. I just got back from a, a, a week long trip to visit my father in upstate New York. Uh, he lives in the woods there uh, on his own in a cabin and it's a two story cabin and he fell down the stairs uh, last year, for example. Um, this year he's doing better, but last year he fell down the stairs and nearly, nearly died as a result of it. Um, it took hours before someone uh, found him uh, and uh, you know, the family flew out. Uh, I, you know, we all work. Um, so we had to immediately, you know, leave our jobs, fly, you know, fly out there to visit him, uh, go to the hospital with him for a week, um, try to figure out what to do. Ultimately, he was able to recover. But we all of us, you know, have stories, care stories in our families like that. And it's a problem that most of us aren't prepared for. And as we go through the, the, our conversation today, um, we can talk more about 
how this program helps fill some of those, so, uh, um, make it a little easier for families to cope with the challenges that we all face. As people live longer, dementia is becoming more prevalent and people often have multiple chronic conditions and medications to take. Have you ever had similar concerns to either of these scenarios? Naomi is afraid her dad's dementia is getting worse. He put plasticware on the stove and nearly burned down his kitchen. He refuses to move to a facility or hire help. Ruben's grandfather could really use medication reminders to keep on top of his insulin doses before he ends up in a crisis and nutritious meal delivery to keep his blood pressure low. Worry about our parents and grandparents or our, old, our own health as we age is something that we all need to cope with. And the need for long-term care doesn't always wait until we're older. Some people need care at younger ages. Calvin is a working age individual with a need for long-term care following an accident. He has spent most of his savings on medical care and worries he won't have enough to pay for help with everyday activities like bathing or getting dressed so that he can work and lead the life he wants to lead. He has, a fa he has family in his life, but they also work and he doesn't want to cause stress in their lives. He is a young man and enjoys his independence. Long-term care is expensive and can overwhelm an individual's or a family's finances. Let's look at these examples. Hakeem turned 50 last year and after caring for his mom, he realized he needs long-term care insurance but can't afford it. Um, it would cost him $2,700 a year. That is the average premium nationwide. That's actually a little bit lower than the average premium nationwide in 2015 for long-term care insurance according to the latest available data. It's probably gone up since then. Um, sometimes prices are quoted lower um, uh, when you're uh, uh, initially buying a policy. But as uh, Representative Macri stated from her own personal experience, and I've heard this from dozens of people over the last few months, uh, premiums uh, tend to go up over time. Private insurance premiums tend to go up over time, often considerably, which leads many people to have to drop their coverage. So even if private insurance might seem affordable because of the, the price quoted at the beginning. Many people pay in for years or decades and have to drop it. Another important thing to keep in mind here is that the, a lot of the marketing materials that are being sent around now talk about how much a premium would cost today on an annual basis. And they compare that to what the Walk Care Fund premium would be, which for the typical worker is about $300 a year. Um, so there's two, two aspects of that comparison that you need to keep in mind. One is, as I mentioned, uh, that annual premium for private long-term care insurance could very well go up over time significantly. That's what history tells us. They have gone up significantly over time. Even more important than that, though, is that for the Walk Cures Fund, you only pay the premium while you're working. So if you are temporarily unemployed, um, you don't owe a premium. Or if you are taking time off to, to raise a child or care for an older adult, you don't owe a premium. You only owe a premium when you're working. And that becomes particularly important when you retire. If you retire at 65, um, you don't owe a premium after that. So say you're 50 years old today and you're trying to make a decision about whether to participate in the Walk Cares Fund or purchase private insurance to opt out. If you participate, you'll pay in for 15 years and then you'll be vested permanently and you won't owe any premiums after the age of 65. So you'll pay 15 years of premiums. And if you make the typical salary of $52,000, you'll owe $300 a year for 15 years. If you buy private long-term care insurance, the premium could be much higher, let's say $2,000 a year. But you'll owe that not just for 15 years, you could owe that for 35 or 40 years because you'll owe that premium until the day you die or need care. If you're 80 or 85, and you're on a fixed income and you figure out that maybe you don't think you can afford it and you have other things that you need to spend, you know, you need to pay other bills and you haven't needed it yet. And so say you're 83 years old and you drop the coverage because you can't afford it anymore. And then when you're 88, you have a fall or you get dementia and you need the care, you won't have that benefit because you have dropped the coverage. So you really have to pay the private long-term care insurance premiums until the day you die or need care. Uh, which is often twice as long or three times as long as you would have to pay a Walk Cares Fund premium. So that means that for, for, um, for many people, um, the, a private insurance premium, you know, if it's $2,000 a year times 30 years, that's $60,000 of lifetime premiums. If you're the typical worker who owes $300 for the Walk Cares premium and you pay it for 15 years, that's $4,500. So that's $60,000 versus $4,500. So you got to keep that in mind uh, when you're con considering the cost of of insurance. 
Indeed, that's the reason why this program was introduced is to offer affordable long-term care insurance to all Washingtonians for the first time. Uh, another aspect of long-term care that we often forget about is family caregivers. Um, I mentioned in my own personal story with my dad, um, there's also, my mom also uh, needed care. My mom had Parkinson's for 15 years. Um, when she had Parkinson's, my, my brother and sister and I all helped out in different ways uh, to help care for her. And that affected our jobs that we had to take time off of work. It affects your career. Um, many people end up quitting their jobs or moving, ac moving across the state or moving across the country to care for a loved one uh, who needs care, which can permanently uh, puts you off of your career trajectory. Often people, you know, typically that happens to us when we're in our 40s or 50s, when we have a parent who needs help. And people who quit their jobs at that age and have to take on another job often take a permanent reduction in lifetime, you know, in, in annual income, which can affect the, not only their income annually, but their retirement ability to save for retirement as well. So there's a ripple effect of long-term care need. And being prepared for that need is not only a favor that we do ourselves, it's also a favor we do for our spouse and our children. Um, in my mom's case, when she needed care, her husband was 60 years old. Um, he had to quit his job 10 years earlier than he wanted to or could afford to. He quit his job at age 60 and then cared for my mom for the last five years of her life. And when she passed away, um, he was 65 and was poor and didn't have hardly any retirement savings. And it was too late for him to get his old job back. So these are the kind of things that, that are important to keep in mind when you're considering you know, whether to participate in the Walk Cares Fund and protect yourself against this risk, so which seven in 10 of us are going to experience as we age, or whether to purchase private insurance and potentially opt out. Keeping in mind that most of us who purchase private insurance now won't be able to afford it on a fixed income throughout retirement. So these are all important things to keep in mind. So why is this important for the state as a whole? Well, uh, if you look at this blue line here, that's the population 85 and older. It's going to double in Washington state over the next 15 years. So the issue that we all face in our families is gonna become an issue for the state as well because of the magnitude of the, the number of people, the number of families that are gonna be coping with this issue in the coming uh, decades, particularly given that most families can't afford to have a stay-at-home caregiver. Uh, what this means for taxpayers is that without the Walk Cares Fund, uh, taxes would have to go up. Sales taxes and other taxes would have to go up significantly to pay for this, the long-term care costs associated with this age wave. With the Walk Cures Fund, we have a new revenue source, a new way of paying for long-term care, just like with Medicare or Social Security, where we all pay in uh, to in advance to fund our care needs when we're older. It's a more responsible and more uh, affordable way to pay for it because instead of waiting to pay for it out of pocket when we're on a fixed income in old age, we pay for it ahead of time when we're working. In terms of the state budget, 6.3% of the state budget over the last two years went to long-term care and that's before COVID. COVID made that a higher number, but if we wanna compare this to the future, hopefully a future without COVID, let's take the 6.3% number as the starting point. If with a doubling of caseloads over the next 20 years, Medicaid costs would likely double as well for long-term care. And that's un, that would be unsustainable from a budget perspective. Taxes would have had to go up. And because of the Walk Cares Fund, because we're now paying in premiums for our care instead of having taxpayers uh, uh, provide uh, Medicaid um, to people who have impoverished themselves, um, the, the budget will be protected from that. And so taxes won't have to go up to pay for long-term care. So why do families need a new approach to long-term care? As, I, as Representative Macri mentioned, the current system that we have is that you either have to be incredibly wealthy to pay for long-term care, either by buying insurance, being able to afford insurance, um, you know, maybe $60,000 of insurance premiums over your life. Most people can't afford that. Or you have to become impoverished to qualify for Medicaid. Um, most people, uh, the, the broad middle, I think there's an assumption in our current system, the way we deal with, with long-term care, it's based on an assumption that the broad middle class can somehow afford to pay for this out of pocket, that only poor people um, need assistance and Medicaid is there for those people. That's just not the reality. The reality is that um, the, the, the typical household income of seniors in Washington state is $56,000. Uh, 
the typical long-term care insurance premium is about $2,700 a year per person. So if it's a couple, that would be $5,400 in premiums. After taxes, there isn't enough money in, in, the, in the typical household's income to pay those premiums. Uh, and so people who don't have insurance, they have to pay out of pocket. Well, a year of home care costs about $33,000 for 20 hours a week of care in Washington state. So if you're on an income of $56,000 a year, after taxes, that might be you know, 40. You can't afford 33,000 out of that 40 to go to long-term care. So when a long-term care need strikes, it, it just blows up the family budget of seniors. It creates a, a significant crisis. Um, if, they have, if you have any savings, you will spend them down quickly and probably end up going on Medicaid. That was the situation here with Diane's dad. Um, and that is a situation that no one wants to experience in old age, but seven in 10 of us are going to need long-term care. So the Walk Here's Fund offers a solution to this problem that families face and the state faces. As Representative uh, Chop noted, it's a universal program that builds on the proud, successful, proven models of Social Security and Medicare, which have worked for, you know, Social Security and Medicare created a new concept in American life, which is called retirement. <laughs> retirement didn't exist before Social Security um, and Medicare. Um, it, before these programs, if you were older, uh, you lived with your with your children in a you know in the upstairs you know in the in the room that the kids grew up in when they were little, um, and you were you were dependent on your children and you didn't have retirement you didn't have independence in old age. Those programs created retirement. Well, with with the long term care need and the decline in the ability of families to have a stay at home caregiver, retirement has become often a, a difficult period for people again, much like it was before Social Security and Medicare. What the, what the Walk Cures Fund does is provide a third pillar to retirement security um, where this need, this risk is addressed. It's an earned benefit where only those who contribute are eligible. Um, it's not subsidized at all from the, the state budget. And so it, it, it's self-funded from worker contributions, reducing the need to raise taxes to pay for the Medicare, the Medicaid costs that come with the age wave. It's affordable by definition because we pay we all pay about a half a percentage of our wages towards it out of every paycheck while we're working. We don't know anything when we're not working or when we're retired. So this can never become unaffordable the way that private insurance premiums can become unaffordable. There's a lifetime maximum benefit of $36,500, which is adjusted up to inflation every year. So in 30 or 40 years, um, you know, if you're 40 years old today, by the time you need care, say 40 years from now, that will probably be 60 or $70,000 benefit because it goes up with inflation. Um, contributions begin in January, benefits begin in 2025. So let's compare the status, the current way we pay for this to the new way with Walk Cares. The current way we deal with this, and that's the way that my family experienced and uh, the, the stories that we heard at the outset, um, is that long-term care insurance is unaffordable for the vast majority of us, especially in retirement. There's a fear of not being able to stay in our homes as we age. Like I am afraid of that. I saw that my mom had to move into a facility um, uh, my dad is panicked about, you know, having another fall and having to leave his home. Uh, none of us want to have to leave our homes in old age. Uh, I worry, we all worry about if I need care, what is that going to mean to my wife and my son? Is my son going to have to move across? I don't know where he's going to live. He's currently 17, but let's say he lives in Colorado. Is he going to have to move back to Washington state and to take care of me, move his family? How will that impact him? So I worry about what that will, the impact on my family. And I worry about having to deplete any life savings I have and uh, not be able to leave anything to my son and, you know, and then leave my, my, my wife struggling after I would pass away um, because I didn't have anything in place to protect myself. The new way with the Walk Cares Fund is that for the first time in the history of this country and in the history of this state, long-term care insurance is affordable for everyone. Any, everyone has access to affordable long-term care insurance. We all have peace of mind now that as we get older, uh, we'll, our families will have a budget of 36.5 that goes up with inflation to hire a home care aide. Make, you can even make an unpaid family, uh, you can make a family caregiver, a paid caregiver if you want. This program allows you to do that. Um, and families will have a budget in place so that you know when we're in that situation where your parent has a fall or your parent gets a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, that rather than having to figure out how to pay for it, you have money there to do something with. You have money to hire someone to come in the home. So what can be really important there is that by bringing in someone right away, 
you can, you can, and, and I'm sure Representative Chop has experience with this, you can, you can slow the decline in a person's health status. So if, if you don't get a home care aid in there very quickly, the, the older adult or whoever needs care is likely to have another fall, break a hip, slip in the shower, trying to get back and forth to the bathroom in the middle of the night, slip on the way there, um, maybe not, not eat properly, not take their medications properly, which can cause a very rapid decline in someone's health status. With the Walk Cures Fund, a family, no matter what their income level, will be able to get someone in the home very quickly to, to, so that, that the loved one will be able to have more years at the end of their life to spend with family so you can have those special moments with your mom or dad or, or yourself when you're older with your children, rather than um, maybe decline more rapidly than you otherwise would have. Um, I'll, I will get through this last part quickly so we can get to Q&A. Um, what's one thing important to know is that for employers, there is no employer contribution. So it's a little different than paid leave in that regard. It's only an employee contribution. And for employers, there, there really isn't much of an additional administrative burden because um, the same system that employers use to pay premiums for their workers using in paid leave, they're gonna use the exact same system to remit premiums to the Employment Security Department for the Wild Cares Fund. So they're just gonna send a little bit more money over, but it's the same technology, the same reporting mechanisms for employers. If you're self-employed, you can opt into this program uh, if you wanna participate. There, to qualify for benefits, because it's self-funded um, and there's no subsidy from the, from the state budget for this at all, uh, you, you need to pay in for 10 years so that, the, so that the math works. So people, if we were to give out the full benefit without anyone paying in more than a year or two, the math wouldn't work for the program and, and it would require subsidies. So because this is self-funded, stands on its own, um, there is a vesting period required of 10 years. Uh, if you pay in for 10 years, you're permanently eligible for benefits. If you've paid in three out of the last six years, you're temporarily eligible. So if I'm 62 and I pay in for three years, I'm eligible until the end of my 68th year. After that, I would no longer be vested. Um, you pay in, if you work a quarter time of 500 hours a year, you've earned a vesting year. So that's about a day, a little over one day a week, about nine and a half hours a week. So for example, if I'm retired, say I've only been able to pay in four years and then I retire, if you do additional things after you retire from your main job, like maybe you help your children with their business for one day a week, or you have a hobby, like you make kayak paddles and sell them on Etsy, or maybe you work at a local store or you drive Uber or Lyft. If you have any earnings at all, either as an employee or self-employed in retirement, and you just work a day and a quarter a week, you can pay into the program for those years and earn additional vesting years in retirement. So that's come, something to keep in mind. Um, and the benefit is flexible, as I noted, you can either hire a professional or you can make a loved one a paid caregiver to keep the benefit money in your household to help pay your bills. Uh, it's a cross agency project, but I won't go into detail on that now. If you want to learn more, you can go to our website, wacaresfund.wa.gov, or you can email us at the wacaresfund at dshs.wa.gov. I'll leave this up for a moment um, uh, so that um, you can take that down if you're interested in getting in touch with us. So thank you, Kathy. Great, thank you, Ben. Um, as always, just a great overview and presentation on this information. Um, we have several questions that have come in um, right now, and then we've also had some questions um, on social media. Um, so one of them is, um, Uh, it's around the benefit level. Um, it says, I've heard that the program pays $100 a day. That doesn't seem like a lot of money. What if we need to use more? Great question. And, you know, legislators agreed with you on that because in, in an early version of the legislation, there was a $100 a day cap, but that was dropped before in the final version of the, of the law. So uh, I know that there, there's some misinformation out there being sent around suggesting that there is a $100 a day cap but that's not accurate. You can spend, there is no daily cap on how much of, the, of your benefit you can use. This is your benefit. You've paid into the fund, um, just like with Medicare or Social Security, it's, it's your benefit. You can spend it you know, on any kind of long-term care that, is, um, that you need. So kind of a follow-on question that, we've all, uh, that I've received is, how did we determine that 36.5 was a meaningful benefit? Sure. Well, it, um, 
it, there's a couple of things that go into that. I mean, I'll pass it off to Representative Macri or Representative Chop. But so that pays for about a year of home care um, of 20 hours a week, which is roughly what most people need in their first year of care. If you budget carefully, um, and for example, say in my own families, you know, we help my siblings, we help my mom um, directly, uh, taking turns to some extent, um, and. If, if you have a loved one in your life who can provide unpaid care some of the time, which most families, you know, you have your loved ones who, who want to care for you in that situation, you might be able to have a combination of unpaid family care and your benefit and stretch that to maybe two years. About half of people need two years or less of care. So, um, you know, there are obviously uh, a minority of cases where people need care for five or more years. That isn't the, the norm, but it does happen. And it's a significant minority of cases. For those situations, that's what Medicaid is there for. Medicaid is the backstop. It'll still be there. If you're in that situation, Medicaid will be there for you. The, the reason why 36.5 was taken as the ben starting benefit level uh, is because you know we, the state wanted to, to have a, a, reason, a, a modest uh, premium level. So a half a percent of wages was deemed to be a, four, you know, a modest premium level. If the, this is a self-funded program, there is no government subsidy for this program. Uh, and so if you had a 1% premium, you could have a $73,000 benefit or, or seven, you know, roughly $70,000 benefit. Um, but you know, that's a trade-off. You know, the higher the premium, the higher the benefit. Um, with this approach, what it does is provide, you know, it kind of respects the role of government in society, which is to provide a modest but important benefit to people. And if people want more insurance, we are working with the insurance community to develop supplemental coverage plans where um, let's say I want to have a hundred thousand dollar benefit rather than 36,000. I can, I'll be able to purchase down the road another $60,000 of insurance from a private insurance company as a supplemental plan. That's something that we're working on now with private insurers to develop those, to help them develop those plans. So a few years from now, those plans should be available. So if you want more coverage, you can buy more coverage. But for many people, they may be satisfied with with $36,000 of insurance and they may not want to pay more than that or not be able to afford more than that. So I think that was the thinking behind that. Representative Chop or Representative Macri, did you want to comment on that amount and how that was determined? Well, I, I would just add that, yeah, it's a balance. We were trying to balance what it would be a substantial benefit, but also of how the premium would be set. So the, it would, went back and forth, but we thought 36,000 was significant enough. In fact, uh, I'm so glad that uh, Representative Macri uh, mentioned her uh, family situation. My mom also uh, was in a nursing home for many years and then was on Medicaid for about, uh, I think it's about four or five months there. Uh, a while ago. And so what that this thing could have been used for is, in fact, is for uh, our family to have uh, home caregivers so she could have stayed in her own home for a longer period of time. Uh, and just, but I think the, it was a balancing act. We're trying to uh, represent all of the people, the people that are going to benefit, but also the folks that are paying into the fund. So we thought that was a good, good balance point. I think that's a good point, uh, Representative uh, Chop, because um, oftentimes in private insurance plans, um, they don't cover in-home care. Um, they might only cover, you know, facility care or nursing home care. Um, so I think that is an important distinction for the Walk Cares program too. So another question we have is, I'm in my 30s. Why do I need to pay into something that's for old people? <laughs> I think we kind of answered that, but I think we could drill down on that a little bit more, Ben. Sure, I'm, I'll give a brief answer, answer, brief answer and then pass it uh, to uh, representatives. Um, I, my, th my thought there is I think of Medicare and I just think, imagine if um, your parents, my parents had decided to opt out of Medicare in 1965. It wasn't possible to opt out of Medicare, but imagine if they had. What situation would they have been in in their 80s if they didn't have access to health insurance, right? My, both my parents have needed a lot of health care in their retirement. Um, I, so the, I think the, the reason why programs like this exist, kind of like with unemployment insurance or workers' comp or Medicare, Social Security, is that we all face certain risks in life, bio, you know, biological risks, economic risks, whether it's you know, losing a job or getting injured at work or uh, getting old, getting sick. And none of us like to think about any of these bad things happening to us, right? And when everything's going well, we, we can all work and earn money and pay for our, pay our bills. 
but you know, bad things do happen to people. Uh, people do get old, <laughs> people do get sick and uh, people do need help. And for those moments, that's what, that's what these social insurance programs or universal public insurance programs are, are there for to, as kind of like a, 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 a support or a net to catch us and make sure that when bad things do happen, it doesn't devastate us. We don't lose our home. We don't you know, have to have dramatic changes in our lives. In the case of this program, it keeps us from having to go to a nursing home earlier than we would have to otherwise. And it keeps our children from having to quit their jobs or take a big hit in their careers because we didn't plan ahead. Yeah, so, I'll just add to that ahead. if I can, um, that um, we, uh, we in Washington are gonna pay for long, the long-term care needs um, of folks, regardless of whether or not we um, implement this program. If we don't have this program, um, the safety net program that many um, folks depend on, um, the Medicaid program will be the main source of support for long-term care. And the interesting thing about Medicaid is that many of us think of that um, as, a, as a, a safety net program for people who are low income. And it is only people who are low income um, are eligible. But the, the biggest expense in the Medicaid program is around long-term care. And most um, of, the, of the recipients of Medicaid funded long-term care um, are folks who never experienced extreme poverty in their lives, um, many in middle income people, but who um, were, spent down their life savings, sold their homes to be able to afford long-term care. And when they ran out of money were put into Medicaid. So as our Medicaid expenses go up, the taxpayer obligation will um, go up for to support the Medicaid program. Through this program, just like Social Security and Medicare, um, those who pay in are eligible for, for getting the benefit out. So it, to me, seems like much more of a win-win for all the reasons that Ben talked about, that it helps people maintain independence, it helps families um, not be burdened. There is that ripple effect, particularly for people who in, are in the prime of their career, taking care um, of, of parents. Um, and um, in the long term is a, is a far more strategic uh, way for taxpayers to get a benefit um, out of something um, rather than just, it, just depending on a safety net program that, that the vast majority of us um, would otherwise need to depend on in, in our late years. And often as Frank shared just a, his mom a couple of months, and I'm sure those couple of months were the most expensive months um, of the healthcare utilization that she had. I know that's true for my grandmother and I know the data supports that, um, that the Medicaid program pays the most for people in those last weeks and months of their life. Um, and this really, as Ben said, most of us will need long-term care for two years or less. Um, and this program will make sure that we all get the benefit out of what we pay in. Thank you for that, Representative Macri. I think that's an excellent point. Um, another question we have, and this is one that I get a lot from AARP, from our members. Um, it's about people who are retired or nearing retirement. So this question says, so I'm 68 and still working, planning to re retire around 70. Um, am I required to pay into this even though I would never be able to gain any benefit? Is this true? I can speak to that briefly. Um, so the, you know, in that case, uh, this, you, you would be um, paying in for a year or two. That's true. Um, and the, as I mentioned, this is a self-funded program like Medicare or Social Security, Medicare or hospital insurance or Social Security. And so um, it, in order for the math to work for the program, for it to be financially viable, it has to be independent, stand on its own two feet and be funded from worker contributions. So it doesn't receive any, receive any subsidies from the general fund. So um, uh, if, if the program paid out benefits to people it only paid in for a year or two, then it, it, that would require a subsidy of some kind. Um, and it's unfortunate for people who are close to retirement who may have trouble vesting. We have a couple of uh, strategies there to, you know, to mention. One is if there is anything that you do after you retire from your main job where you earn it, you know, if it's a day and a half a week, as I mentioned, you can earn additional vesting years that way. If you get to three years doing that, 
Um, you do have temporary vesting in the program, which can help a lot of people if you have a health event uh, in three years, any time within three years after that, then you would be eligible for benefits. Um, I also wanted to mention that the oversight body of the program, the LTSS Trust Commission, which oversees our program, is currently looking at policy options uh, to, to address this concern that you raise. Um, is there any way to help people who are very close to retirement to make it easier for them to qualify for benefits? That's something that we're looking at. We're trying to do it in, in you know, the program is trying to do it in a fiscally responsible way. Uh, they're working with the actuaries on that. Um, so there may be some new developments in that regard. Uh, I don't know if Representative Macri, if you wanna to speak to that any further. Yeah, I think you covered it well. Um, so um, we are definitely looking at some of these questions and with like with any program, um, it was I think a pretty well thought through um, program design that was passed in 2019, mm -hmm. but we have had um, bills to tweak the program since its initial passage actually um, over the last two sessions and we expect that to continue. And um, since Ben came on board as the director, the commission, um, which includes eight legislators, um, Frank and I are two of those eight legislators who are involved um, and a full array of stakeholders and agency staff. Um, we are further refining some elements of the program. So this is an excellent question and one that we're definitely um, diving into to come up with some, some um, options for folks. And one of the things also in the in the legislation, it was written um, that we're required to work with the insurance industry. And I think that there's real possibility there. Um, you know, it's it's interesting to think about can the insurance, the private insurance market, would they be able to develop some type of policy that would have a, an equivalent benefit that was affordable? Um, so I think that's something that's also as an option. And I just really appreciate having both um, both you and um, Representative Chop on the on the Long-Term Care Trust Commission. So next question is, uh, this is one that's related to the current situation with insurance. Um, I'm 32 years old and I've been fighting to get coverage but denied by all agencies due to them quickly changing their policies on who they could, who they would and would not cover. Can you extend the deadline? And then this is, these are questions coming in, I guess coming in from constituents um, that were emailed in, I think to one of your offices. Another one was I'm 61 and a half years old and plan to retire when I'm 64. 65 at the latest. With the new long-term care law, I'm being forced to look into private long-term care insurance because the current law mandated long-term care will not provide any benefits to me. I don't understand why you would expect me to pay $800 a year for nothing, even if I would qualify. So there's kind of, there's two questions. Um, and it, and uh, there's a third one that's around portability, um, as I'm not sure if I'm going to retire in this state um, I, and when, when and where I'm going to retire. Um, and so kind of that's a big, <laughs> big question, but a lot of that has to do with the current, you know, situation around the insurance agencies. I could, um, I could take the first one, Kathy, and then go maybe, ahead. Yeah, the first one um, is, uh, you know, that's part of the rationale why this program was introduced in the first place. So um, the private long-term care insurance industry is, a, is has failed over the last four decades. Um, it, it's, this is an example of what's called, economists call market failure. Uh, the, you know, government typically steps in where the mar private market, where the free market has failed. Um, there are cer you know, certain examples of this, you know, the, you know, the, the free market never built an interstate highway system. So the government stepped in to build an interstate highway system, you know, roads and bridges. There are certain things that don't happen naturally in the economy where, the, that where a government program is important. The, for four decades, uh, legislators have been working with the private insurance industry 
hoping and hoping that they could develop a solution that would work for the broad middle class. And they haven't been able to. They had four decades they weren't able to. They're not gonna be able to do it this year. They're not gonna be able to do it next year. They, they have, there are no magic, uh, you know, magic tools in the, in the toolbox there. Um, and so what you're seeing this summer is that um, brokers are trying to sell policies, uh, marketing against the Walk Cares Fund. They're just trying to sell whatever they can sell um, as quickly as possible, knowing that a lot of people are gonna drop the policy a year or two later and that they're only buying the policy in order to not participate in the Walk Cares Fund. The insurance carriers are very frustrated by this the insurance companies, because they only make money if someone keeps a policy for a long period of time. Otherwise, they just have upfront costs for writing a policy, but they don't get the profit from maintaining the customer. And so the insurance companies have pulled out of the market because they're frustrated with the brokers um, and they're frustrated with the fact that people are buying policies just to drop them a year later. If the deadline were extended, it, all that would do is prolong the problem. It wouldn't solve the problem because the insurance companies aren't gonna come back into the market until the deadline has, has passed because they don't wanna sell policies that people are only buying, buying in order to drop them a year later. And so that's, that's not a problem that the Walk Cares Fund can solve. That's just a problem endemic in the current private long-term care insurance system. Representative Chop, you had a comment? Yeah, to build on what Ben just said is that uh, these are uh, very helpful ideas and input. Uh, uh, Nicole and I, uh, with other folks, uh, are going to be taking a look at these specific uh, instances. So we very much appreciate the input. Uh, there's been a lot of legitimate questions raised, and I think there's some potential ideas and solutions here. So uh, thank you for putting forward these specifics, uh, because uh, it's important for us to respond and try to solve these uh, certain circumstances in the overall program. So thank you very much for doing this. So another question, and Ben, I've heard you talk about this a little bit, is that um, a lot of people who do pri buy private insurance, um, in effect, over-insure themselves. Like they don't, um, you know, they don't use all their benefit that they've bought. Uh, what's the what's the numbers and the data um, on that? And I know you have some experience and, and knowledge on that. Sure. I mean, so this is different than, you know, um, life insurance, for example, where if you buy life insurance and you pass away that there's a dollar amount of the policy that gets paid out. For long-term care insurance, uh, if you need long-term care, you don't get an amount paid out. You know, you can only use so and so and you know a certain amount per day per month. Policies differ in that regard, but typically there are caps, either either on a monthly basis or a daily basis, on how much you can spend. And so that doesn't exist for the Walk Cares Fund. And so somebody may pay a lot more than the Walk Cares Fund premium to get a policy that that has $150,000 of coverage, for example. So maybe you pay 10 times as much, typically it would cost about 10 times as much to get that coverage. Um, and you need long-term care. Let's say the policy only lets you use uh, $4,000 a month uh, for your care. Um, you need care for a lot of months to use up that $150,000, right? In many, in, in many cases, people only use, you know, a quarter of the benefit or half of the benefit of the policy amount that they bought um, before they pass away. And so they effectively overinsured themselves. And indeed, that's part of the business model. That's how a lot of insurance companies make money on long-term care insurance is because most people don't use all of the benefit that they purchased, right? And with the Walk Cares Fund, um, there are no daily or monthly caps. So you can use as much of it as you want to use as quickly as you need it. Uh, and so I think that's, I think it provides a, an adequate amount of insurance, but there's no danger of being overinsured the way there either is with, um, with all private insurance. Yeah I'll, just add on, yeah, I'll just add on to what Ben and um, Frank said. So um, I just want to echo what Frank said, that um, since the, um, the public um, and many of our constituents have become more aware of the details of the program and how it will impact them specifically, we've heard a lot of feedback about some of the finer details in the plan. And I'll say some of these um, questions that people are saying, why haven't you figured this out already? Um, the answer to that is because we're going first. You know, Washington State is really leading the way um, in the social insurance program. Um, and much like we learned from the um, small number of states that went ahead of us on paid family leave um, so that we were positioned to pass the strongest and most progressive paid family leave um, policy in the country when we passed it, 
going first on the long-term care social insurance program means that questions like portability, uh, re reciprocity with other states means there's not, it's difficult to do reciprocity when you're the only one doing it, but we are exploring um, ways to um, make sure that, um, to see how the benefits can be portable. Um, one of the challenges that we have is that the long-term care um, system is pretty state specific. Um, because uh, that because Medicare doesn't cover long-term care, um, that the, the states really administer a lot of the long-term care, um, oversee a lot of how the long-term care structures work in individual states. Um, and so in some ways, um, we are really, I think, setting an, an example for other states um, and getting this input now has been really helpful in the conversations that we've had both at the legislature and um, with the with the commission for Washington Cares. And I know um, I've been working with my colleagues in other states who are looking at very similar legislation. Um, California, for one, um, Illinois. Um, there's a, a few other states that are looking really specifically at what we're doing here in Washington State. And I definitely see that in the future, that will be an opportunity for that, those types of reciprocal agreements. Um, so I think you know those things are all on the table. And I think the good thing is we have time. Um, benefits don't you know start getting paid out till 2025. Um, there's work, you know, there's time to kind of look at some of those creative ways to give people the ability to work in Washington State and then retire in another. So I want to kind of wrap us up. We have four more minutes um, left. Um, so I'd like to open it up to Representative Macri uh, for some closing um, comments and then uh, to Speaker Chop. I tried to get to all of the questions. I, a lot of them were answered in Ben's remarks and the comments that all of you had. Um, you know, I know that there's a lot of people wanting information and answers. And I know, you know, I know the Walk Cares Fund, you know, email has been that you know overwhelmed and they're trying to as quickly get to all of those I, we're getting a lot of questions in ARP I'm sure you as legislators are also getting questions and we're trying to respond to those as quickly as possible and that's why we're hosting these webinars is to give people an opportunity to learn more about this program and be informed consumers so representative Macri would you like to have some closing remarks yeah, I just want to um, thank everyone for coming today and thanks um, really for all the questions in the chat here. This is really helpful for us to understand um, the, um, the, the questions that folks are having as you learn more about the program. Um, I'll say building on the experience of the paid family leave program, um, I, you know, that's just been in effect for the last um, you know, couple, two, three years. And I know so many people in my, um, okay. in my network who have um, used that benefit. And it's, it's almost difficult to imagine um, what things were like before we had uh, that benefit. It's really been a safety net for many people. And I anticipate the same with this program. Um, and I know questions will continue to come up as we're in this launch phase, but as Kathy says, um, we have um, a couple few years here to get through some of these questions. And I'm quite confident given Washington's track record that this is going to be, um, we are all gonna come to depend on this essential program. And I just wanna encourage people, uh, particularly if you live in the 43rd legislative district in Seattle, please reach out to me directly with questions. I'm glad to chat more about this program um, or, or anything else around uh, state issues that come to mind. Thanks. I guess I'm next. Uh, well, I, yes, echo what, uh, I echo what Nick, Nicole just said. Uh, welcome everybody to the effort here today. Have the questions answered. Kathy, if you can give us a, uh, the uh, copy of the chat and the questions asked, because literally today at 3 o'clock, I believe Ben uh, invited me to a meeting talking about this very program. Uh, and we need to respond uh, to these questions. First of all, uh, maybe we need to provide more information. In other cases, we should consider changes or tweaks to the program to make it uh, address certain specific uh, input that we get. So please, uh, Kathy, get us those. 
And we actually have some ideas about how to solve some of the specific questions. Uh, I got to do a little more research with people and consult with other uh, legislators. Uh, uh, but we're considering a number of things to make this program a success in the future because uh, this is extremely important. Uh, I think uh, people who have ever visited somebody in a nursing home or have seen other circumstances like that understand the real need for this investment. And we feel this is the right way to go, but we need to make sure we address the concerns that are out there in tangible ways. So anyway, thank you very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Well, again, thank you everyone for joining us um, and sharing your questions and, you know, keep those questions coming and to any of our agencies to ARP or to your state legislator or to DSHS. So again, thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.